I'm not really standing here for applause. I'm just trying to wait till everyone gets in. Um, I'm really delighted this morning to have the opportunity to introduce uh, my longtime friend to you. I hesitate to say my old friend. I think both he and I are to the point where you question what the use of the word old means when you say old friend. But we have been friends for many, many years. Glenn really has a long list of professional accomplishments that I, uh, I would like to tell you uh, a little about. He graduated from the University of Utah with a bachelor's degree in 1953, he received a master's degree from BYU in 1962, and a PhD from BYU in 1975. <clears throat> Before coming to BYU, Glenn coached uh, at West High in the Salt Lake City School District for quite a few years. Uh, and he played nine seasons of professional baseball. He coached baseball at BYU for 17 years. During that time, BYU teams earned 13 division titles, three conference titles, two district titles, uh, and two appearances in the College World Series. He was uh, NCAA district coach three times, president of the American Association of College Baseball Coaches in 1977, and in 1974 was selected as coach of the U.S. team, which won the World Amateur Baseball Tournament. He was also inducted into the Baseball Coaches Hall of Fame in 1979. He was appointed athletic director uh, at BYU on July 1st in 1976 and has served in that position for the last six years. In that position and the previous ones, he's gained a national reputation as a very fine speaker. I'd like also to tell you just a little bit about the background that uh, Glenn and I share. Um, we grew up in the same hometown. He's met today a couple of people that share that same background, I know. We attended the same high school, and we have many, many of the same friends that have been old friends of ours for years. We also obviously have chosen education as a career and have uh, in part dedicated our lives to young people. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have shared the influence in our lives of two great men. I'm sure Glenn will agree with me that uh, my husband, who has been Glenn's best friend since they were five years old, and my dad, who was his, one of his high school uh, coaches and teachers, have really had a tremendous effect on each one of our lives. I'm very proud to share with that with Glenn. And it's my pleasure now to introduce my dear friend, Glenn Tuckett, to you. Appreciate that, Anne. That is a pleasure to be here with such dear friends and many of you whom I know very intimately. Flattered to be asked. Uh, always nice to be meeting with those who share the same aspirations in the area of education. Uh, when Ann called and asked if I could be here, I told her, certainly, I uh, just do what I'm told. Learned obedience uh, as a youngster. <laughs> I grew up in a home where it was important that I do what I was told. I had a dad that felt that that was a, a real uh, important part of my young life. Uh, could get you in a little trouble, however. Uh, when I was 18, going to my first spring training, uh, my mother, as I was ready to leave, said, Glenn, I've got uh, one piece of advice for you. And I said, Mother dear, what could that be? She said, uh, put on a clean pair of socks every day. And I thought, gosh, that's good advice. But after the eighth day, I couldn't get my shoes on. <laughs> and so, so when Ann said, be here, why, I'm, I'm really here. And happy to be here. Happy to be here. I, I get a kick out of some people that say, boy, we've taken you away from your busy schedule. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad you do. Uh, that's, you don't have to apologize for that. I'm glad to get out of the office. It's a rat race all the time. Just an absolute rat race. The things that have happened this morning, you couldn't believe between about 7.30 and 10 minutes to 10. Why, you just couldn't believe what happened. But one of the things that happened, uh, our football, we're always recruiting. Always recruiting. That is a thing that we do just consistently and constantly. Uh, someone said recruiting is like shaving. If you don't do it every day, you're a bum. And I think that's true. That In, in college athletics, you have to recruit every day. And one of the problems is that there, you have a boy there for a couple days and one night. The NCAA legislates that. And our football coaches run out of things to do. We haven't got one guy on our football coaching staff that can take a kid on a tour of the library. <laughs> he just, uh, I'm going to point it out to him one of these days. But so they, they run out of stuff to do and say, and they bring him to me. 
And this morning, Roger French, I was going to say who coaches our offensive line, and sometimes they are, but the kids that, the kids that play on offense brought a big old kid in, big old guy, about 6'5 and about 260, you know, they're getting bigger all the time. He said, Glenn, I'll be right back. And, and that was it. And the kid was just standing there, and I was just standing there, and I thought, uh, uh, how old are you? <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> he said, 18. And I said, geez, that's good. And uh, I said, uh, what's your name? And he goes, Ralph. <laughs> I said, now, I got this when I ask your age, but how come this when I ask your name? He said, well, happy birthday to you. <laughs> so don't expect too much out of our offensive line. Another thing that just happened that, that you may be interested in if you're a sports fan at all, uh, we were just in El Paso for a, for a little thing last Saturday night, and uh, I, I was thinking as those guys were getting the heck kicked out of them, those El Pasos by us, it used to be the other way. And I remember a few years, to show you how far football's come, there's a few in here, Jim Jensen, a few others here that remember that because we were down close. I used to get a kick out of the people that be in the stands and say, we didn't look very good today. And I'd say, you ought to be down on the field where I am. <laughs> if you think they look bad from the stands, you ought to be down where I am. But we had a ball, we had a chant. Well, one year, things were so bad that our coach, we won four ball games and our coach was selected as the coach of the year in the conference. So you can see how bad things were. It looked like on this particular Saturday, we were going to tie. Now, we didn't ever play for wins in those days. We just didn't want to get beat. You know, a tie was a victory for us. Late in the ball game, late in the game, it looked like we were going to tie. 14-14, they'd punted the ball to us. We had done about our own 35, just a few seconds left on the scoreboard, and we had a chance to tie it. We weren't going to lose. Jeez, it was exciting. Our two quarterbacks had been dinged a little tiny bit. We had a third guy. And the reason he was third was that he had two things he couldn't do. He couldn't throw a lick. He was a terrible passer. And he could never get the ball in the pocket. He'd hit him on the elbow, put it on the... He just couldn't quite get it in there when he was handing off. But he could do two things. He could kick the heck out of the ball. He was really a good kicker. And he didn't fumble. And so the coach said, now look, young fella, we've got a chance to tie the ball game. Don't do anything stupid. Just run three quarterback sneaks and kick the ball as hard as you can. He said, okay. He was an obedient kid. So he goes in there and he comes out. And of course, with the ball deep in our own territory in a tie ball game, they kind of slacked off a little bit and went into a wide six and gave it. So he comes out and boom, and up he goes. And he goes 15 yards for first down. Comes out of the huddle again and bang, another quarterback sneak. And they drag him down on the 35-yard line. Well, he came out of the huddle again, ran a quarterback sneak and skipped through everybody. And they drove him out of bounds on the three-yard line. Well, you can guess it. Jeez. <laughs> We come out in punt formation, and he kicked the ball right out of the ballpark. And after the ball game, we had a chance, after the ball game, the coach said, young fellow, what in heaven's name were you thinking about when you kicked that ball? He said, I was thinking about what a dumb cluck I had for a football coach. <laughs> I think that's right. So we've come away since then. Final reflection of this morning. I went into the town as I, before I came here, and I just traditionally have always got off on 13th South. That just seems to be, that's where Dirk's Field was, and, and four of the greatest years of my life were spent there as a member of the old Salt Lake Bees baseball team. And as I, I, I just, we're trying to come up with a little, uh, oh, a get-together, a reunion of the old, uh, well, the 40 eight and 49 teams dick larner and i are working on it and i've thought about it and as i drove by the ballpark today i was thinking we had a kid that played third base named reno Chezzo. reno could play very devout catholic boy and he hit 350 every time he every year he ever played he hit 350 great hitter just a great hitter we roomed together quite a bit on the road and of course i was a devoted member of the mormon church and we talked a little bit about those things but Old reno was hitting about 250 and i was hitting about two i mean he was hitting 350 and i was hitting about 200 uh, I knew all about slumps. I one year went oh for May and June, and uh, so I knew all about having bad luck at the plate. But I noticed when Reno went into the batter's box, he used to cross himself, and then he'd step in the batter's box and wham, boy, a line drive and go for a base hit. 
So one day after going 0 for 5 the day before, I said to Reno as we were taking batting practice, I said, Reno, you know my background and I know yours. Uh, do you think it'd do me any good if I crossed myself before I went into the batter's box? And he says, nope. And I says, why? He says, because you're a lousy hitter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I was... When I was going by the ballpark today, I thought of that, that darn guy. I have given this assignment some thought because of my lovely friend Ann, uh, and because of you. I've thought about this, and I've thought to myself, now just what kinds of things should we talk about as those involved in education? And I can tell you one thing, I'm just proud as punch to be an educator, and hopefully I can live up to the title of an educator, and hopefully you can too. I've thought of a lot of things that perhaps we could use uh, as a subject or a title. Let me just run through with you the three or four things I contemplated. I thought of the, the lines from Ulysses, uh, uh, Tennyson's poem, you know. He, we'd retired Ulysses, but Tennyson wouldn't let us. And he said this, How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished and not to shine in use as though to breathe were life. I thought about that as a subject. I know some people that think they're teaching because they show up, because they breathe, they think they're an educator, and I don't believe that. I think you're rust. I don't think you're unburnished when you do that. And I thought that may be a whale of a thing to start with. And then I thought of, of another. Someone once said, those who hear not the music think the dancers mad. Now, I think there are people out there that think you and I are absolutely mad to be involved in education, that the remuneration is sometimes questionable, the involvement, the hours, the de all of that is there. People can't understand how we can be so dedicated, but they don't hear the music. We hear the music, and we know why we dance, because we hear the music and we see the end product. I also th thought that when I... I I'm proud, as I say, to be a part of education. And someone once said, take a child by the hand and you take his parents by the heart. And I think that's true, that when you take a child by the hand, you take his parents by the heart. And I've had a whole different outlook on education since I've become a dad. When I was just a teacher and not a father, uh, it was fun. I, did, I gave it my best shot. Used to get upset when I had to go past the school zone 15 miles an hour. Don't do that anymore. It's my child I don't want to hit. Yours, okay, but not mine. <laughs> and, and I feel that way about teachers now. When I go to back to school night and PTA meetings, I'm really concerned about the, about the determination and the dedication of those who teach my children. That's, that's my best product. And I want it to be treated with great concern. Let me just rehearse with you. I'm not a note refer to, but I want to refer to a note or two. Just let me hit a couple things that I've been putting together over the last years about education. And then I'll get on with the things I want to say. Education as such has just emerged from four distinct and somewhat antagonistic decades. The 40s, the decade of the traditional three R's. The 50s, the Sputnik decade. The 60s, the unbelievable decade of free speech movement, the psychedelic missionaries, the Huxleys, the, the Tim Learys, the Allen Ginsbergs campus unrest, student rebellion, the 70s, the prodigal area, the time of wasteful spending of teaching and learning experiences, the era of transition, back hopefully to the basics, maybe too early to, act, to accurately accept, to assess the 80s, but I know we're in there. The prospect of the 80s to me is mind-boggling. The public as such momentarily and hopefully temporarily lost confidence in education. Restoration of that confidence is the prime objective of present day education. We must remove the stigma attached to traditional educational practices. We have been training people to live effectively in the past. One of the paramount reasons for schools to exist today is the removal of ignorance. As we begin to tee it up on the front nine of the 80s, we begin to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Significant things are underway as we begin to customize the curriculum to fit the needs of the students instead of vice versa. Other than in doctrine, uniformity is a convenience, not a crusade. 
In the past, the high school has forced almost everyone into a college preparatory program, supposing that all students will apply for admission to MIT or Caltech. We're just now, the past few years, beginning to realize the need to fill the voids in the trades and in the marketplace. I've often thought, what's wrong with being a happy plumber? In my mind, there's nothing wrong with that. It's admirable. Actually, it is our challenge at this very moment to bring together the world of education and the world of work, two worlds which need each other far more desperately than either realize. It appears to me that there is a domino effect that really determines how the public or society reacts to education and to the educator. Except for a PTA meeting or a back-to-school night, the public views the school and the educator through the kaleidoscopic eyes of their children. Consequently, if we are, as educators, are going to relate positively to the public, and by the way, we have many publics to which we must relate, it is incumbent upon all of us to relate positively with the public's children. The chain reaction is educator, child, parent, public. Present-day education must replace the attractive counterfeit of the rebellious and disruptive 60s with the harsh reality yet optimistic outlook of the promising 80s. Today I'd like to discuss the most, most important aspect of education, and to me that's you, the teacher. Let us be proud of our profession. It is the most noble of all callings. All of the people I admire most since the beginning of recorded time were educators, not the least of which was Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior of the world. Rejuvenate your thinking. Refresh your outlook and your attitude. Be excited about the thing you do. Edison said, I never did a day's work in my life. It was all fun. People ask my daughters, what does your daddy do? And they say, oh, he goes down to school and plays ball with the boys. And that's about it. I think that if I ever thought that what I did was work, I wouldn't enjoy it half as much. And so I'd suggest to you and to me to fall in love with your work. Just fall in love absolutely and unashamedly with your work. The daily regimen, I would suggest, is one that's fairly simple. I would think that as these young people come to you to be educated and to be taught, I would hope that you would love them. And I'm not going to say them. I'd say, mmm, love them. They need to be loved. I'd say, work them. They need to be worked. Just work them. That's important. I'd say, prepare them. I'd say, prepare them. I'd say, inspire them. Then I'd say, commit them. And I think if we can do that to those people with whom we work every day, then that's important. I can't remember a day in 28 years of being a school teacher where I didn't walk into the classroom like it was the seventh game of the World Series. I mean, I, I, I was ready. I thought it was important that I had a classroom at Brigham Young University exactly this size with about 200 to 250 kids in there every day to be educated. And I went in there every day with my, with my quiver full because I thought it was important. I may be a lousy teacher, but I tried hard. And I'll tell you that's important, that you have to be prepared and be ready for them. So don't be afraid to love them. I think that this word love is sometimes misunderstood. It's a hard word to say for me. I know all the synonyms for love. It's a sissy word, I thought. I thought only sissies say love. Only sissies love, and only sissies let people love them. But as I grow older, I find that it's probably one of the most important of all the words in, in, the, in our language. And I think about love. I think about the man of Nazareth as he started his ministry. And those that were a little bit skeptical came to him one time and said, what's the most important of all these things we're trying to do, all the laws we're trying to keep? And I found out that the law of Moses was a lot more than Ten Commandments, and I'm sure you found that out too. And they wanted this man of Nazareth to commit himself by saying something that would be incriminating. And he said, the first and great commandment is that thou shalt love, there's the word, love the Lord thy God. And he said, the second's like unto it, you ought to love your neighbor. I think that's important. I think it's important we learn to love. I think it's important that we understand that that, that heavenly being whom we, whom we feel so strongly about is, is, is love. Because John said it as he chronicled the life of the Savior. He wrote, one time wrote an epistle and said that God is love. Paul, who wrote and traveled and missionary, said, Faith, hope, charity, all, uh, faith, hope, charity, long suffering are all important, but the most important of all is love. This stuff must be really important. Burt Bacharach said it was. He wrote a song a few years ago entitled, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. That's the only thing. There's just too little love. 
not just for some, but for everyone. He went on to say, Lord, we don't need another mountain. We got plenty of mountains. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. I'm just dumb enough to believe that. I'm just naive enough to believe that 20 to 25 year old young people that come to your classes still need to be loved. Pearl S. Buck wrote a, a short story a few years ago entitled Christmas Day in the Morning. The, the whole gist of the story was that a guy as he was older reflected back on his life and found out that after age 15 his life was never the same again because he overheard his parents talking when they didn't know he was there and found out that his mom and dad really loved him. That they'd never told him that. They'd never really made that apparent to him. Wouldn't that be terrible to have kids come into your class, spend a semester with you or a quarter with you, whatever it might be, and not know that you really love and appreciate them? I think you've got to do that. I'm kind of a, I'm a toucher. I've got, I got to get with people. I've got to be around people. I've got to get up to them. Every time practice started, I was around just being with guys. How's everything? Everything going well? I've got to be up and kind of rub and touch a little bit. And I think that means to a, to a six foot five, 260 pound tackle, you can't go up and walk, slap him on the shoulder pad and say, hey, the coach really loves you. you know, see, what kind of a guy is this? <laughs> but you got to do some other things to him that says, hey, the coach really loves me. He really is concerned about me. And I think you got to do that with every student. I was impressed as I watched the ball game Saturday. I like Jerry Faust. I don't care if he goes one and ten. But that guy that's taken over at Notre Dame, I like him because he's not afraid to say that I'm a Christian. He's not afraid to say that I'm a coach, I'm an educator, and we're going to get it done. All the king's horses and all the king's men aren't going to stop us. And he goes around before that ball game, and boy, he looked every kid in the eye, and the kid knew that coach loved me. Now, they got beat, but they got beat with a superior team. But they got beat. But that doesn't mean the coach doesn't love them. That doesn't mean they can't love the coach back. But I believe that those kids in your class, and you're going to see them, I don't think they change a whole lot. I don't think they change from the second grade to the Ph.D. era area of their education they're all the same they still need to be recognized the greatest teachers i know are those that recognize performance do you know the greatest teachers i know animal trainers you ever seen the guy at the seal show he said get him go over and do this and he does it so feeds him a fish right then he doesn't say stop by at the end of the semester and i'll put a fish on your report card uh -uh. <laughs> right there feeds him a fish right now that is immediate reward and if seals like it and horses like it, kids like it too. And so you've got to reward them every once in a while. Pat them on the back, be nice to them. Do you know kids come from some homes where mom and dad don't like each other? They come from homes that are impoverished. They come from homes where they wouldn't know love if it come up and slapped them in the face. But they know something's lacking. But they're going to come into your classroom. They're going to be in your area. And one of these days you're going to be able to communicate. Soul to soul, eye to eye, you're going to be able to communicate, hey, you're really special to me. You're really special. And that changes their whole life. Changes their whole life. I can go back and, and just list all the special people in my life that have treated me with great respect. And I think that's what we as teachers have to do. Don't be afraid to love them. Don't be afraid to tell them. Don't be afraid to show them. My daughter, I came home from a road trip, <laughs> been away for about 10 days, missed my daughters, missed my wife, put my oldest daughter on my lap, put my arm around her and said, you know, Allison, Dad really loves you. She says, oh, I know, you told me a hundred times. And that was it. i got to give them my time. They don't like lip service. They don't like all that chin music. They want action. They want to play jacks. I don't like to play jacks. I can get them all now. <laughs> don't like to play it. I can play hopscotch. I can go in back door. I can do all that stuff because that means, hey, Dad loves us. He'll come out and play with us. And if the time comes when you can't drop everything to be with your child or somebody that needs help, somebody else's child, how about mine? If mine's here, drop something and take care of her, please. Right now, the greatest test I have for love is when my number three daughter comes up to me and says, Hey, Dad, will you go 10-speed bike riding with me? I'd like to get my hands on the guy that invented the seat on the 10-speed bike. <laughs> I got about two blocks of love in me when it comes to 10-speed bike riding. That seat and my seat aren't compatible, I'll tell you that. But that means that Dad loves me. And what do we got to do as parents? We got to teach kids that we love them, our own children. They've got to know it. Wouldn't, be ter wouldn't it be terrible if they didn't know it? Wouldn't it be terrible if kids in your classes didn't know you felt strongly about them? And I, I can tell you, you can be macho and still love. You can be just as tough as nails and still love. A few years ago, the Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl for the second time. For 10 years, just absolutely annihilated the opposition in the NFL. But after that second Super Bowl win, in that celebrating dressing room, there were the television cameras, the interrogator was there, and Vince Lombardi, the great, late, 
verbal, emotional, Vince Lombardi was there. They had him up on a table. The cameras were whirling, and the, and the guy says, Coach, how come the Packers win all the time? How come you guys are so predictably successful? Blocking, tackling techniques like everybody else in the league. Kicking game like everyone else in the league. Offense, defense, design, pretty much the same. How come you guys win all the time? And I watched him. Lombardi tried three or four times to get it out. And finally, he wiped a tear from his cheek and he said, The Packers win because the Packers love each other. Now, if you've ever seen Henry Jordan or Ray Nitschke, only a mother could love those guys. <laughs> But he said the Packers win because they love each other. That's the thing that makes it go. When you get a cohesiveness in this faculty at the technical college, like I think you've got, like I, as the ones I know that you've got, this thing goes because there's a feeling of love and affection one for another. You respect each other, and so you get it done. And if you don't have that, it's never going to happen. If you don't have that on a ball club, it's never going to happen. A few years ago, two years ago, in fact, Michigan State should have, everybody said, going to win the Big Ten. The year before, finished strong, had a very good ball club, into the preseason, eight games, they were four and four. Four and four with the best club in the country, probably. And they were just muddling along, getting nothing done. Finally, after a loss, they got back to the field house. They said, hey, coach, can we just have a little talk without you? The kids wanted to visit. And they sat around in that dressing room at Michigan State and tried to figure out what in heck is wrong. How come we're not winning? What's gone wrong with us? We're supposed to be good. People keep talking about our potential, about our potential. And to me, potential will get you fired. I can tell you that. As a coach, potential gets you fired. You've got to get rid of all those potentials. You've got to play with the doers. But these guys are saying, potential. And finally, one kid said, well, what's, what's missing? The guy that was the 12th man, he said, now, I've had a chance to watch us more than anybody. <laughs> the, the, guy, the old 12th guy gets to watch a lot of ball games. And he was saying, you know, the thing that I see is we don't love each other like we did last year. Little cliques are kind of forming, and we're not together, and we just don't love each other like we used to. And one of the old big J. Vincent says, hey, that may be right. Magic Johnson, yeah, maybe we don't love each other, man. And they start talking, and pretty soon they're in the middle of the floor, arms around each other, touching, saying, hey, potential, potential. And they started to love each other again. They didn't lose a ball game the rest of the year. When they got into the NCAA playoffs, they didn't have one ball club come within 20 points of them. And if you were lucky enough, you saw them annihilate a couple of them right here at the University of Utah to win the NCAA championship. They were kids that learned how to love again, how to appreciate each other. So if this is going to be the faculty that it ought to be this year, you better learn to really get cohesive and respect and love each other. It's not a sissy word. Second thing, work them. Please work them. Please work my kids. I want them to work. I, I'm so tired of the word perspiration. It just is a... It's, let's sweat for a change. Let, let's, let's quit perspiring and start sweating. My goodness, we just go around and work for all... Geez, we run through the dictionaries and all those kind of things, trying to find synonyms. Let's just come right out and say it. That if you're going to make it, you've got to work. That is... It's the key to success. It is the absolute key to success. Now, the, the dominant church in the area, the LDS church, always talking about, I never hear them talk about leisure out your salvation. They're always talking about work out your salvation. And I think you work it out in Christian living and you work it out, I think, in school and every place you go. I've never seen a guy that was worth his salt that didn't work like heck. Now, I've seen a lot of people that work hard and don't really achieve. Some people mistake activity for accomplishment. Some people work hard but aren't successful. They just don't get going in the right direction or they're not channeled where they ought to be. But I would say, teach them how to work. Demand that they work. Thank heavens for a, a Wayne Nielsen, Ann's dad in my life, who was a math teacher. And I, I get a kick as Euclid was talking to that young king in, in Syracuse. He said, look, sire, there's no royal road to mathematics. And Mr. Nielsen taught me that there's no royal road to mathematics. You just got to work at it. Thank heavens for teachers like that. Thank heavens for athletics. Thank heavens for an, an era where you can't buy success on the installment plan. Right now you can, I guess, I just heard where it came down, the prime's 19 and a half this morning, which is great, but you can, you can fly to Paris and return and pay for it later. You can drive a car with an oval window in the side and pay for it later. You can live in a $250,000 home and pay for it later. But in athletics, you've got to pay in advance. I love that. How many times have I thought, oh, if we can just win this Saturday, we'll prepare all next week. Mm -mm. <laughs> Boy, you got to pay in advance to make. And I think that's important that you got to teach kids that they're going to get paid in direct proportion to how hard they work and how they produce. And that's really important. Paul Dietzel once said that more characters taught on the two yard line than any place else in life. 
And all that means is, is when they got you about two yards from your goal line, going to shove you into your own end zone, you better strap on your hat and grab a handful of grass and go to work. That's all he's saying. You better go to work. Thank heavens for growing up in a home where my dad thought that work was important. My dad was inherently, spontaneously, congenitally, almost nauseatingly ambitious. It bordered on nausea. Oh, jeez. We used to... It'd be snowing, you know, in the winter. He'd come down about 5 o'clock. Come on, let's shovel the walks. I said, Dad, it's still snowing. Around our place, it didn't count if the snow hit the ground. We had to catch it on the way down. <laughs> Jeez, we'd do ours and Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Cox. We were all over the neighborhood. My dad was with me. I thought, boy, it doesn't take much to keep Dad happy. Just give him a snow shovel and let it snow. And Oh, but he, he wasn't afraid to work. Ambitious. Boy, right, my father passed away a few years ago, but when I even had an inkling that he was coming, boy, I'd go around, roll up the hose, sweep out the garage. You know, I didn't, boy, he'd have been mad at me. Jeez, I'm 45 years old, and he'd have been really chewing on me because the ro- hose wasn't rolled up. My wife's friends and sister and brother-in-law came from England this summer. Uh, they are confident that she's married beneath her station, and I'm trying to do everything to dispel that and so we painted and bought new stuff i was painting the back screen door and i thought that i you know screens you get paint all over them and that little part up underneath i said i'm not gonna mess around with that no one's gonna look there and just as i was putting the brush away i thought where's the first place dad would look boy i'm on my back painting up under that baby (laughs) the specter of my dad is right there every minute of my life every minute i can't walk past a, a piece of of paper on the sidewalk. I, I'm going into to my office every morning. I'll pick up a paper and put it in the voice can as I go by. And the kids say, boy, they sure dress the custodians good around here. <laughs> but that's just the way dad was. If I don't pick it up, who's going to? I remember when I went into athletics, my dad said, I don't care if you're very good. I think he did care, but he said he didn't. He said, I don't care if you're very good, but I'll tell you one thing. Don't you ever play less than your hardest. Don't you ever loaf. Don't you ever do anything but work your very hardest. If you do... I won't let you play anymore. My gosh, he meant it. So every time I ever thought of loafing or going half speed, there was my dad right there. He's still there thinking, don't you ever loaf. Don't you ever do less than your best. That's a great lesson. And we've got to teach kids how important it is to work at stuff. They think people that are there are lucky. Someone said luck is infatuated with the efficient. And I think that's true. There's an infatua- infatuation there. That that's, the people that are lucky are the ones that prepare for it. That's when preparation meets opportunity. Pow! They say, oh, he's lucky. Uh-uh. All the good ones are looking for it. That's the thing I, I can't imagine in life, that people go by and don't see these things happening. I've always thought, Ted Williams, lucky Ted Williams, best hitter that ever played in baseball, greatest hitter I guess the game's ever known. If it hadn't been for two wars, he'd have rewritten all of the record books. But the thing I like about Ted Williams is that he worked harder at his trade than anyone who ever played. I thought he was just lucky. I thought he was 6'4", 210 pounds, built like spring steel, great eye muscle coordination. That's why he was so good. Lucky Ted Williams. Born hitter. Someone said that the gestation period for hitters is 2,000 hours in the batting cage. (laughs) That's what it is. That's how come you become a born hitter. That Ted Williams used to hit every day. When he was a kid, he'd go to grade school, get there when the custodian got there, get the balls and bats out, and he'd hit before school, he'd hit at recess, hit at lunch, hit at recess, hit till till the custodian went home, and then he'd go and hit till dark at the park. I thought he was just lucky. Every day in spring training with the Boston Red Sox, he'd hit every day till his hands bled. Every day in spring training. Now, that hurts to hit till your hands bleed. Geez, I've had guys that get a hangnail and they're out for a week. But this guy used to hit every day till his hands bled. That's what work will do. And we've got to re-enshrine the nobility of work or else take it out of dictionaries. One of the two. We've either got to start doing it or quit using the word because there's not a lot of it going on today. There are so many lazy, get-something-for-nothing people in the world that it just makes you sick. That I get to kick out all those people that want minute rice and ready-made cakes and get-rich-quick schemes. They know all the shortcuts. Do you know you never really appreciate a shortcut until you've taken the long cut? You really don't appreciate minute rice until you've done it the other way. You don't appreciate ready-made cakes until you stirred one up from scratch. You don't appreciate getting rich until you work for it. Buy that stuff. That's the stuff that makes you successful. Not that get it and let's make it in a hurry kind of stuff. Let's go out and let it 
mature and make it right. So let's re-enshrine the nobility of work. Next thing, let's, let's prepare them. Boy, kids are coming out sometimes that aren't prepared, can't spell. Jeez, I get a kid a kick out of, I taught a health class. It was a great class, I thought, because it had the subject I really used to like. And we'd be talking about some things once in a while, and pretty soon some guy would raise his hand, and he'd start giving me his opinion of what was going on, either in the world of health or in the world of something. And I didn't take much credence in it because he couldn't even spell. You know, he can't spell something. And yet he's, he's going to be, we're going to lateral to that guy. Ten years now, hey, here it is, go run with it. Uh-uh. Boy, doesn't it scare you to get on the airplane? Think, geez, did this guy cheat his way through flight school? <laughs> you know, kids can't spell, can he fly? You know, you got to be a little careful with that. Really careful. I get a kick out of, they, they get on coaches. You know, the coach, geez, there's no way, to, there's no place to hide. You can't dig a big enough hole. On Monday, you find out how he did. How is it, wouldn't it be something if we just put in the paper every Monday someplace in some section, maybe near the funny papers, something, the medical results of last year. Old Ralph, the surgeon, had 19 operations, eight survived, seven died, and four are hanging in there. You know, jeez, be a little scary, wouldn't it? Go under a knife of one of those guys. I got, I heard this, what do they call the guy that graduated last in his class at medical school? Doctor, you know. There's one for you to think about. So you've got to be a little careful with those guys, too. So let's, let's teach a little preparation. Let's teach them how to spell and read and all those kind of things and teach them how to go out into to life and in society and be productive. We've got too many drones out there. People don't like Ronald Reagan because he thinks you ought to work for what you get. Now, that's a stupid idea. And all that kind of stuff. I get a kick out of Paul Harvey about how many of those people riding on the humpbacks of the laborers. We've got to teach people to go out and, and be prepared. To f I don't know what's coming on. I don't know where we go from here. I don't know how many blacksmiths we're going to need. I don't know how many anythings, except I saw in yesterday's paper that chemical engineers are starting out at 27000 a year because they're really needed. So let's have our, have our, kind of our hand on the pulse of the future and get them prepared. That's really important. Preparation. Preparation. I get a kick out of people who who can't see an opening when it's there. When I was a kid growing up, we didn't have television, like with some of you. You used to have to go down to the Murray Theater and watch the newsreel. And when we'd watch the newsreel, uh, free of charge, Carl and I, thanks to Mr. Duvall, he'd let us come in and watch the newsreel. And we'd see, we saw the Dion quintuplets grow up, as you know, and all that kind of stuff. But we used to get to the sports. There was a guy that was a champion named Joe Lewis. The brown bomber from Detroit. And boy, could he do it. He didn't rope a dope or do any of the funny stuff. He just, boy, he plodded around. And the thing I liked about Lewis was that he just used to just plod around. And as soon as somebody, he was prepared, he was looking for it. And as soon as somebody would do that, and it was all over, bang. They'd pick him up and carry him out. Six months later, another guy would come, bing, he'd get him too. Just bang like that. Just drop it, boom. Oh, I love people like that. That are out there salivating, looking for openings. And boom, away they go. <laughs> uh, gee, that's... As a teacher, I get a kick out of hearing people say, oh, now there was a great teaching moment. You know, I, they, religiously I hear that all the time. Oh, that was a great teaching moment. Well, in your class, isn't it great when you're up there at the board and you're talking and you're leading them along, like, just bringing them right along and you got them going with you, and finally somebody says, hey, uh, Mr. So-and-so or, or Miss So-and-so, uh, what about this? You say, oh, boy, I'm glad you asked that. There's the teaching moment. Boy, your eyes brighten, and you go right at them. When kids ask a question and want to know, boom, that's when you hit them. Be prepared. Be ready for that. Wouldn't it be terrible? Let, let me just read what uh, Winston Churchill said about lack of, of preparation. If I can just find that. It's, he's made a great statement about the preparation that we should have says, to every man there comes in his lifetime that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered that chance to do a very special thing, unique to him and fitted to his talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for that work. Ooh, that's a terrible thing. And I think we ought to be looking for openings. I go out now and, and play 21 once in a while. Well, I get three athletes to stick around. We play a little under the bucket 21. And when I was young, I used to go, boy, I'd fake and go baseline and lay it in and kind of wave goodbye. And I could see the opening. Now I fake and boot, and there's the kid standing there. Boy, kids are getting fast these days. 
and I wonder what's happening to those openings that used to be there. And I see some of you in life. I see some of some of people. Do you know in life you're either the pounce-er or the pounce-e? You know, you either pounce or get pounced on. And I know some people are great pouncers. They see that opening and wham, away they go. And I like that. I know some people, they put their hands in their pockets and yawn a lot and say, uh, geez, there goes an opportunity. And, uh, there goes another one. And they just sit there and yawn and watch opportunities go by. Boy, you got to jump on those. They don't come very often. I remember one time, I'm, in, I'm with the old Salem Senators baseball team in the Western International League. We're just finishing spring training, and I had just, I'd set the game back 50 years. Just terrible. I hadn't done anything right. Dropped a pop fly that lost a ball game in spring training. Left guys on third base by striking out and stuff. And I was so impressive that the manager called me, hey, you. That, that was it. He didn't even learn my name. We had three games left in Redding, California. I knew I was on my way home. I just knew that after the game, I'd be released and sent home. I'd informed my parents of that. Sitting in the dugout, watching the first game of three-game series in Redding, California. We were on our way back to Salem, watching what was happening from the dugout. Sitting next to Bill Bevins, he used to pitch for the New York Yankees, almost beat the Dodgers in a no-hitter one year in the World Series, except Lavagetto hit a ball and beat him in the last inning. But old Bill kind of adopted me, and we're sitting there watching the ball game. In the first inning, we noticed that the guy on the mound for the opponents, when he'd come over here, it was fastball. When he'd come over the top, boom, fastball. When he came out here, curveball. And we were calling every pitch sitting in the dugout saying, oh, fastball, whoop, there it was, curveball. Well, in the second inning, our third baseman goes to the plate, and the first pitch is, boy, he swings and fouls it off. Next pitch is up and in. The next pitch, the umpire says, strike two. And he starts to argue. And he argues. And he argues in spring training, and he got thrown out of the ball game. And just as that happened, old Bill Bevins, who was a moose, he put his hand behind me on the bench, went like that. And so when the manager looked down there, I was the only guy sticking out. And he says, uh, hey, you. And so, geez, I grabbed a bat. I almost told the umpire, hey, you, hitting for John Hack. I, geez, I thought that was my name. But anyway, as I went to the plate swinging the bat, I told when you go up to pinch hit, well, you assume the ball and strike count that's on the hitter. So it's one ball and two strikes. Whew. And I'm on my way home anyway. But as I, as I dug in, I thought, uh oh over the top, fastball, curveball. So there, on the first pitch, he comes this way, curveball, boom, and it was up and in, and I knew it was a curveball, and two and two. Next pitch, he comes over the top, and oh. Huh? Boom, fastball, and he hit my bat. And <laughs> God, the, the ball went into left center field for a double. I got two more hits that night. Started the next night, got three hits. Started the next night, got three hits. Opened the season at Salem. At the end of the year, the two co-valuable players of the year for the Salem Senators, which wasn't a tough job, Bill Bevins and Glenn Tuckett. I was on my way home, but I was prepared. Fastball, curveball. Fat, oh, that's be prepared. Do you ever see a hitter get what he's looking for? Oh, geez, their eyes just dilate and they, suddenly, they just jump on the ball. I get a kick out of Garagiola and Kubek. They'll be announcing the ball game. There's a guy standing on third, dusting himself off, and one of them will say, he just hit a perfect pitch. And I say to myself, how could he hit a perfect pitch and be on third base? Hit it 410 feet up the alley in right center for such a perfect pitch. How'd he do that? Well, it was a hard slider down and away, low and away. Well, if the hitter at the plate's looking for a hard slider down and away and he gets it, it's not a perfect pitch. That he's prepared. Wham! That's when he hits it for three up the alley in right center field. And I think in our lives, let's be prepared. That's a great, uh, the scouts say you ought to be prepared. You ought to be prepared. Prepare the kids. By your pre There's no way you can prepare kids if you're not prepared. Those young people that come into your class can spot a phony. Oh, they can spot a phony. And if you're trying to teach something you don't believe, if you're trying to teach in a way that you really aren't, they're going to know it just like that, and they're going to turn you off. And they're going to put those earplugs in their, in their old ear and turn on the stuff they want to hear. So we'd better make go out there and be very, very genuine. One other preparation thing I've got to tell you, because we've got local people here. A few here at Murray, we grew up at Murray High School. Jeez, it was, I'll tell you one thing. At Murray High School, we never had anybody that was conceited. Never. We had a very, very low self-image. We were the smelterites. That was our nickname. Now, how can you get cocky and be a smelterite? There's just no way. Couldn't even go to the pep assemblies till you were a junior. You couldn't spell smelterite. You couldn't have any fun. So we all went 7 through 12. We went the same, uh, to the same school. And about this time of the year, 
We had the biggest day of the year in Murray. It was hello day. And we'd have a watermelon bust, a football game with Bingham in the afternoon, and of course a matinee dance right at noon before the football game. That was the big day. So I'm in the ninth grade. Oh, life is a bowl of cherries for Glenn Tuckett. I'm playing on the sophomore football team, scoring a few touchdowns, throwing a few passes, kicking a few extra points. I'm the president of the ninth grade class. Gee, life is fun. And I ate all the watermelon I could hold. We're sitting in the gym watching the seniors dance with the pretty girl. We only had one. And they, they were out dancing with her. And right there, he and I, Carl and I were sitting there together. And finally, Coach Myrick walks in. He says, Glenn, come here. And geez, I bounded out. I said, yes, sir. And he said, I want you to dress for the varsity game today, and you will kick the extra points. I thought, oh, geez, I hope we don't score. <laughs> you talk about a guy that was scared. I can't remember anything except there I am standing on the sideline, and we're playing Bingham. Now, you guys that are new here don't understand Bingham. You guys that are old guys and gals, you really understand Bingham. In those days, there were no, no rules of <laughs> eligibility. Geez, those guys were married, had three kids, been <laughs> working on the copper for five years. God. Every guy on the Bingham football team had a mustache. Oh, geez, that's when guys with mustaches were really tough. And boy, so I'm standing on the sideline. They score and miss the extra point. Finally, we get the ball and we run it down the field. And Gene Bankhead, our tailback, takes it in for a touchdown. And coaches, go ahead and get in there and kick the extra point. Well, in those days, they didn't have enough. Well, you should have seen my helmet. I think Newt Rockney broke in with my helmet. I could scratch my head through my helmet. Jeez, it was like a stocking cap. And so you'd trade helmets with the guy that you went in for. And I went in for our fullback. He was a Polynesian kid, had a head like that. And so I took his helmet and geez, I put it on. It came down to the, I'll never forget. I put, I got in the huddle. I went like that and it just flipped. I could, I said, geez, I'm, I'm fainting. And oh, nope, I just, the hat was down there. And I'm standing in that huddle. And this is an important game, Bingham and Murray, that was civil war, you know, it was really important. And I looked around, I'm a ninth grader and every guy in that ball club was a senior. And we had a good football team. They were all my heroes. I went to bed every night praying I could be like those guys. I could name them for you, Jack Hughes, Bill Costellic, Dave Kazarian, Jay Mauer, I could name all those guys for you. And not one of them said a word. I looked at all, and nobody said a word except their eyes said, don't you dare miss that. <laughs> God, I was kidding. Well, as we were just in that huddle waiting for him to, you know, it's really a tough call point after touchdown. Was he there? I thought to myself, never in the history of mankind has there been a kid more ready to kick an extra point than was I. That's all I ever dreamt about was kicking extra points against Bingham or hitting home runs or making foul pitches. I never wanted to be a cowboy or an Indian or a fireman. Didn't dream about girls. I didn't get married last 31. I, all I wanted to do was kick extra points. And I had kicked him a zillion times in my mind. I had kicked him thousands of times, really. If I'd had a little ability, I'd really been good, because I practiced all the time. <laughs> and as we came out of that, a little Bill Costello says, okay, point after touchdown on two, and out we come. And as I got lined up, geez, we got the ball down, got it through, and we go ahead seven to six. They scored, missed, we scored, we beat them 14 to 12. Boy, was I prepared. That was a great feeling of being prepared. And when you, boom, when you had time to pull the trigger and you got it there, send the kids out prepared. And the final thing I think we ought to do is, is inspire them and commit them. My favorite song is Stout Hearted Men. It's hard to dance to, but it's my favorite song. <laughs> Start me with 10 who are stout hearted men and I'll soon give you 10,000 more. That's a great fight song. But there's a verse in there that says hearts can inspire other hearts with their fire. And the strong obey when a strong man shows them the way. To be the kind of teacher, the master teacher that this generation demands and deserves, you've got to inspire them. I can't remember a lot that my teachers taught me on the board, but I can remember a lot that they taught me about how to live, the kind of people they were, and the inspiration they were to me. I get a kick out of people say, well, we heard somebody speak, and boy, was, didn't he motivate you? And my answer is, heck no, he didn't motivate me. I think that's a joke. I don't need to be motivated. I think motivation comes from within. Inspiration comes from without, and I need continual inspiration. That comes from without. Motivation comes from within. I got my little motivator in there someplace by my cholesterol maker. I don't know where it is, but it's in there someplace. But as a coach and a teacher, my quest, my holy grail was to locate the motivator button on kids. I wish it was anatomically exact, like noses and ears. So that you say, ah, boop, there's the motivator button. Boop, just go and activate it. But you've got to probe around with kids. You've got to punch them in a few places. Ah, there it is. And once you activate that motivator button, get out of the way. 
because they'll stomp all over you because they're ready to go. And the only way you motivate kids is to, to live so that they, they're inspired by what you do. And if they come in there and you walk into that classroom and say, this is the best math teacher in, in the history of, of, of schools because of the way you come in there, they're going to be motivated. And that's what we got to, we've got to inspire them. So hearts can inspire other hearts with their fire. And the strong obey when strong people show them the way. And never in the history of man have we needed inspiration like we need it now. Never have we needed people that are committed like we need it now. That I think as teachers you've got to be committed. You've got to be committed to this thing. I get so upset with people that want to go into education and if that doesn't work I'll go sell real estate. I get upset with coaches. I get upset with guys that, that, that go out and and want to be a coach. And if I lose a couple of years, I'll be a counselor. Geez, if they can't coach, I don't want them counseling. My kid, I think that's stupid. We got so many of the, of the safety valves in life. Geez, I'd like to see him fade back and throw one for a touchdown. But we've always covered, sorry, boop, drop it off the fullback, get three yards and punt. Ah, that life, we've got to be committed to doing it right. We don't have to get out funk and wagnall to find out what commitment means. It means I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it with enthusiasm. That's commitment. And if we can have committed teachers, we're going to have committed students. And I'm not even going to worry about the next generation. In fact, I worry little about them anyway. They're bigger, stronger, faster, and better than our generation was. But all we've got to do is make sure that they go out prepared. If we don't, we have missed one of the great opportunities that will ever happen is that we've got the best raw material. We've got those gobs of protoplasm. I used to think every year, when those kids come to me to play baseball at BYU or to play football and baseball at West High School, i got so many gobs of protoplasm. And I've got my little mold, and I'm going to put them in there, and they're going to come out looking like a championship BYU baseball player. They're going to come out looking just like that because I'm going to mold them that way. And is that fun to just take all that stuff and watch it when it comes in and mess around with it and mold it and cut it here and do something there and... When the semester's over, you wave goodbye and say, hey, there goes an educated kid. I've done something with that guy. I've taken some of that protoplasm and made it out to be something pretty good. And I'd hope that we'd do that. And the inspiration and commitment is, that is there is really important. And I take license with you to tell you one story in conclusion. It's the baseball season, I believe. It's hard to tell these days. We got football going, baseball going, geez, basketball there in their preseason stuff, soccer's out kicking each other in the shins. You can't tell what what season it is, but it's still baseball. And a few years ago, in fact, many years ago, it used to be a few, but in 1948, Lou Boudreau was the recognized best baseball player in the American League. He was the most valuable player in the American League. He was a shortstop. Couldn't run real fast, wasn't a great, didn't have a great arm, couldn't hit the ball out of the park every time, but he could play. He knew how to play the game, and at 26 years of age, he was the manager and the shortstop of the Cleveland Indians. A playing manager and just a kid. Great player. Well, we got down to the last game of the season. It's 154 games, not 162. There weren't the expansion teams then. They got down to the 100. 54th game and Cleveland was playing that day at Municipal Stadium on the shore of Lake Erie for the American League pennant. Earlier in the day, Boston had won. Now Cleveland had to win to tie for the pennant. If they lost, it was all over. If they won, they'd have a one-game playoff the next day with the Red Sox to see who represented the American League in the World Series. Well, they were playing Detroit. There were 72,000 fans just packed in that ballpark. Boudreaux, the best player in the game, was on the bench because four or five days earlier he had sprained an ankle severely and couldn't play. And so he's on the bench, and in the bottom of the ninth inning, Detroit's ahead by a score of 3-2. to two. There are men on second and third. There are two away, and a guy named Bob Kennedy's at the plate. Bob Kennedy, who was just recently fired as the general manager of the Chicago Cubs. He's been around a long while. A good player, big old right-handed hitter. And with two away, men on second and third, behind by a run, the pennant resting on that time at bat, there's Kennedy at the plate. And so the first pitch, wham, geez, he fouls it off. Next pitch up and in, next pitch he fouls that one off, and the count's two strikes and one ball, and, and Lou Boudreau emerges from the dugout, goes to the bat rack, grabs a handful of bats, and says, Mr. Umpire, Boudreau hitting for Kennedy. And he goes up and says, Bob, I'm going to hit for you. Now a guy's got to be out of his mind to go hit with the whole game, the whole year, depending on what he does with one strike. He hasn't got three, he's only got one. 
And I don't care if Lou Boudreau popped up, struck out. I don't care what he did. Hit a home run. It doesn't really matter to me because there was the commitment that I'm looking for. Here's a guy that said, hey, the whole thing depends on how I do it. Boy, that's important in life. There are not enough guys that say, hey, let me do it. They want somebody else to do it. So Boudreau digs in. First pitch, boom, up and in. Two balls, two strikes. Next pitch, out over the plate and... Boudreau laces it into left field for a base hit, two runs score. Cleveland wins the ball game, ties for the pennant. The next day against the Red Sox, beat them 10 to nothing in a playoff and went on and won the World Series because one guy was, had enough commitment in his life to say it all depends on what I do. Just think what this university right here, this college would be like if every one of you said, hey, let me do it. Hey, I'm going to... I'm going to work so hard that I hope that, every, that I am the... Wouldn't it be something if, if you were the worst teacher in the college? How, what you could do to lift the, the effectiveness of teaching at this college? If you went out and said, hey, I'm going to just keep pushing it up. Oh, that's important that we're committed to this thing. And I conclude with a little, little poem. It says... An old man going a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a swollen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. That swollen stream held no fears for him. But he paused when safe on the other side and he built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day and you never again must pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build ye the bridge at even tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there followeth after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This swollen stream, which was not to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building the bridge for him. Ladies and gentlemen, good luck this year, and thank you for your kind attention. Tucket. That was very enjoyable. We'll break now for lunch over to the North Cafeteria and reconvene at 1.30. Back here.